Thank you very much, and thank you for having me. The talk we'll give tonight is in several parts, actually. It's um, called Living Well with Arthritis, Minimally Invasive Joint Replacement, Facts versus Hype. So the first part of the talk will be about living well with arthritis, things that you can do that don't involve surgery. And later on, we'll talk about different surgical options. And at the end of the uh, presentation, I'm going to introduce you to a patient of mine who recently underwent a type of knee joint replacement that was less invasive. And you'll have a chance to meet him and ask any questions about uh, his condition before or his recovery, and he'll have an opportunity to share his experiences with you. At, at the end, of course, there'll be plenty of time for questions. So first, a brief background on what is arthritis uh, and whom does it affect. One in three adults in the, in the United States have one form or another uh, of arthritis, and it seems to be on the increase. A million and a half people in the state of Washington have it, and there are really, it's, arthritis is not one condition. It's more than 100 conditions, although the most common one by far is osteoarthritis, which accounts for 80 to 90 percent. Some people call that degenerative joint disease, so you may have heard it referred to by that name. Uh, osteoarthritis and the other types account for nearly a half a million joint replacements per year in the United States. Arthritis can affect any joint in the body. Among the large joints, the knees and the hips are the most common, with the knees being more commonly affected than the hips. The way it appears is as much as it does in the cartoon on your left, where the joint surface cartilage, which is the white shiny stuff that you see there and that you see on top of a chicken bone if you break one open, gets eroded through by a destructive joint condition. You can see it also in the hip with the normal hip on your left and the arthritic hip on your right with the smooth bearing surface on the left being what it should look like and the eroded and roughened surface on the right being what happens when it develops arthritis. Patients notice that they have it. Uh, when it presents gradually over time, sometimes with a visible change in appearance. The example I'm showing here is obviously rather extreme, but uh, and most people notice it well before it gets to this point. The symptoms that it causes is pain, typically with weight bearing, if it's a, a joint in the legs. Uh, if it's a joint in the arms, it can be stiffness or pain with particular activities. Again, stiffness is a hallmark of it, but pain is most commonly what brings patients to seek attention. Most people, before they come to the physician, even their primary care doctor will try a number of things, inclu including avoiding the activities that bother it, uh, rest, ice, uh, or over-the-counter pills. The diagnosis is one of the more straightforward diagnoses that we make most of the time. More than nine times out of ten, uh, a physician can tell that arthritis is present by simply taking a good history and doing a thorough physical examination and getting traditional x-rays, like the one that you see on your right. On the x-ray, on the left side of that x-ray, you see a black line between the thigh bone, which is at the top, and the shin bone, which is at the bottom. I'll see if I can get you an arrow to show you that. That black line that I'm pointing at is cartilage, which is see-through on x-ray. When the cartilage wears away, it gives the appearance of the bones getting closer to one another. And sometimes you hear people talk about bone-on-bone -bone arthritis, which is what it looks like when it's quite severe, as it is in this case. Very occasionally, blood tests are helpful. And that's for the less common types of arthritis, such as rheumatoid arthritis or lupus. In those situations, referral early on to a rheumatologist who's a specialist in the unusual types of arthritis uh, is warranted and helpful. As I mentioned, the first part of our talk is how to stay active with arthritis. The recommendations vary a bit by joint, and I'm going to emphasize the area that, I'm most, that I most commonly treat, which is arthritis of the hips and knees. But as I mentioned, it can affect all the other joints. And in our question and answer session, we can certainly get into those other joints uh, if you'd like to. The bottom line is it's important to stay active with arthritis. And I want to share a few ways that you can do that. In general, what you'd like to do is to remain active, but also avoid high impact or high loading types of activities. Exercise is important, regardless of what kind of arthritis you have or what joints it might be affecting, both to keep the joints supple and flexible, but more importantly, or as importantly, to maintain good overall health and cardiovascular fitness, which can not just prolong life, but improve the quality of life. If you haven't been exercising and would like to start, it's important to check in with a physician if you have other health conditions that might interfere with your exercise regimen. 
but in any case to build up gradually, not to overdo it at first, which can be both painful and also frustrating because you'll find that you get more uncomfortable than when you started and it can actually discourage you from continuing. With respect to the joints in the lower half of the body, uh, I'll break it down between cardiovascular exercises and strengthening exercises. The cardiovascular exercises uh, are important, again, regardless of what type of arthritis you have or, or where it hits. If you've got arthritis of the hips or knees, it's often possible to work on a stationary bicycle or a regular bicycle if your balance is good. But sometimes people have trouble if the seat isn't high enough because the range of motion is affected early in those joints. If you keep the seat a little bit higher, again, try it first on a stationary bicycle for safety, you'll find that you'll be able to, to get through it pretty well. Uh, almost all patients with hip and knee arthritis are able to do this if the seat is kept high enough. Treadmill, on the other hand, is sometimes difficult because you're loading the affected joint. And that, most commonly, is what causes the pain. So most people will want to avoid the treadmill if they have hip or knee arthritis. But things like the stationary bike can sometimes help. Range of motion exercises, sometimes under the supervision of a physical therapist or a trainer, other times on your own, are fine. Swimming or water exercises, I think, really are the best for people with hip or knee arthritis, and I want to spend a little more time talking about those. <laughs> what I commonly hear when I bring that up to people, though, is that if they tried to swim, we'd have to call in the Coast Guard, or they don't have webbed fingers and webbed toes like ducks, and so it's not going to work for them. But what it turns out is even if you're not an expert swimmer, it's possible to get into the pool either in a supervised exercise class like water aerobics, or just on your own walking and jogging, sometimes with the floats like you see in that top picture, using a kickboard, or even in shallow water using uh, upper, upper body aerobic exercises. And any of those things are possible for people who don't consider themselves strong swimmers and are good for maintaining flexibility and good cardiovascular fitness, even if the joints of the lower half of the body are involved because the water tends to unload them. A common question that I get is how can I tell if the pain that I'm having with exercise or the discomfort that I'm having with exercise is okay or if it's gonna make things worse? It's hard to know without talking to an individual person, but in general, here's what I would say. Arthritis pain is often sharp and well localized to one part or another uh, of the knee or the hip. It's most commonly there when you're putting weight on the joint and it tends to go away when you get off of it. Muscle fatigue, which is okay and actually desirable, when you're doing exercise is different. And that will show up as it's sort of a diffuse achiness above and below the affected joint that's clearly in the muscles and away from the joint itself. And you will typically be able to associate it with the severity or the, the duration of the exercise that you just tried. It may actually last well after the exercise and that's okay too. And that's why typically we recommend a recovery period after a good workout. Uh, when you're first starting out, it's a good idea to have a 48 hour recovery period. The next most common question I get is, if I exercise, will that make things worse? Well, again, it matters what the exercise is. Arthritis, as you saw in one of the first pictures I showed, the one with those erosions through the joint surface cartilage, is an abnormal bearing surface. Like an abnormal bearing in a car or a truck, if you run it hard, it's going to tend to wear it further. So if you're loading an abnormal bearing with your body weight on a treadmill or with jogging, we might expect that it would cause the arthritis to progress. But movement without load or under a reasonable load is often very well tolerated and in most cases recommended. And that's why, again, swimming is a great way to start an exercise program or water exercises if you haven't been doing anything else before. In any event, some people aren't so concerned that it's going to make the arthritis worse, but rather that it's going to make it harder for it to get fixed. I have some patients who are really avid runners and they say, you know, I'm okay if I continue running, it bothers me after I run, I know it's making things worse as long as you tell me that you can still replace the knee sometimes down the road, sometime down the road. And the answer is that almost always we can, that even if it gets worse in the course of normal use or exercise, it does not tend to prejudice the result of future surgery and it should not be a particular concern to most people. Again, if you've got unusual circumstances, this is definitely the kind of thing you'd want to talk uh, with a surgeon uh, or a physician one-on-one -on -one about. Big decision is, when is it bad enough to go get help? What I would say is if your pain is interfering with your typical daily activities, walking, shopping, chasing the grandkids, or leisure activities that are important to you, it's worth checking in at least with your family doctor, especially if you've already tried the easy stuff, the over-the-counter pain medicines, rest, uh, changing your activity uh, regimen. Uh, at that point, I would say it's reasonable to at least check in with somebody. And most of the time, if you've got arthritis and have symptoms at that level, your family doctor may try a few things, but typically you'll wind up in the office of an orthopedic surgeon. You needn't fear 
that when you get sent to the orthopedic surgeon, you're going to get operated automatically. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, I only get to operate on about one out of every 10 patients that I see. So nine out of 10 patients who I see, we, we find some way to make them comfortable without surgery. I say fortunately or unfortunately. It's fortunate for the nine patients and uh, for the surgeons who want to have big houses and fast cars, you know, it, uh, you'd like to be doing more surgery. But uh, the bottom line is we can, we can make most people comfortable without doing surgery. Um, the initial line of defense is activity modification, weight loss if possible, using a brace in some cases, not very commonly. Some people would prefer a cane to other things, and that's certainly an option. We'll tend to unload the joint. Anti-inflammatories or uh, painkillers, analgesics, uh, are a good first line of defense for some people. I would caution you against using narcotic pain pills early on uh, because they tend to be habituating or addictive, uh, and they can cause other symptoms uh, that are as bothersome as the reason you took them in the first place. Some joints, some joints are readily injectable, the knee joint being one of the more common uh, joints. Uh, with knee arthritis, there are a number of different types of injections that we can try, uh, cortisone type shots or joint lubricating fluids. Uh, how to choose one over the other is something that we can get into in the question and answer if it's a topic of particular interest to you. But they both are commonly used for patients with arthritis of the knee. And most, many patients can get a beneficial effect, at least for a period of time, from one or the other of those types of injections. How do you decide when it's worth having surgery? Well, if you can't do that, you should rush. No, that's not, that's not really true. Most people can't do this, even in the best of health. And I recommend that people consider thinking about surgery, at least, if they've tried non-operative approaches and they still have pain that limits their self-care, their walking, their important leisure activities. But at that level, it's almost always a risk-benefit calculation. What I do is a quality of life type of operation. A joint replacement is a quality of life operation. It's not a life-saving operation in most cases. And so the patient has to make a very personal and very individual decision that is based on how much pain and limitation he or she has weighed against the risk that goes uh, along with any operative procedure. And in order to make that risk calculation, you really do need to work with a surgeon who's done a number of these before and does them on a regular basis because everybody's medical profile as well as their joint profile is a bit different. And so the risk profile winds up being a bit different. And so it, it turns into a very individual and personal discussion that you have with, a, with an experienced surgeon to decide whether the time is right for you to go ahead with surgery. Ultimately though, it's the patient's choice, not the doctor's choice. I've not yet said to somebody you need to have your knee replaced. It really is if you're at the point where it's bothering you significantly and you'd like to try something to make it better and you understand this risk, then we would proceed. But it's not something that I've ever told a patient that they need to have. Most of the mobile joints can be replaced. By far the most common are the hips, which is the upper left, and the knees, which are the next two from the left. I've got an elbow and a shoulder up there just to illustrate the point, but those are much less commonly done. And now we're into the second part of the talk, which is how to decide what type of joint replacement, a traditional approach, or the so-called minimally invasive surgery. I'd like to give you a little background about minimally invasive joint replacement. I think at the outset, minimally invasive joint replacement is a misleading name. I'm going to use it because it's so commonly used now. But I don't think anything where you're making an incision over a major joint and putting in foreign material uh, that's as large as a joint replacement prosthesis can be really considered minimally invasive. The, there are always surgical risks to these procedures, and whether we can minimize them, that may be, but it, at no point does it become like having skin surgery or dermatology uh, procedures or anything that's minor like that. This is, these are real operations no matter how they're performed. So the minimally invasive procedure, you've got to decide, is it a different operation or is it a different surgical approach? Are there potential benefits? And what are the risks, if any, that go along with the so-called less invasive procedure? Lastly, it's worth considering how long has the procedure been done and has it been tested in a way that we would consider scientific? What you've got in pictures there are two different knee replacements. The one on the left is the so-called less invasive or minimally invasive partial knee replacement. And uh, our patient who's going to be joining us later in the talk had one of these and he can talk to you about his experiences. And right next to it is a more extreme type of a knee replacement that was done for a patient with cancer and it involved a much more extensive dissection. Obviously, you can't compare the two, but they're both knee replacements, and so you've got to decide what the differences are. Starting on the hip side, I would say, in general terms, hip replacement is a complex and technical operation. You've got to be able to see things in 3D as the surgeon. They've got great success rates at 10 years, well in excess of 90%, and we've got 40 years of data to share with